This week, I welcome comedian Ian Lara. People will literally look at your comedy, not like it because it's not their sense of humor, which is fine, and then suggest that you end your life. <laughs> <laughs> How crazy is this? No, it is How crazy. crazy is this world that we live in. <laughs> no, it is. This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. I'm with Ian Lara, everyone. Welcome to Watkins. Welcome. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you paused and <laughs> I was like, oh no, did I say something wrong already? <laughs> no, I never know how long the intros <laughs> last. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I just wait till I'm spoken to. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. I love I love doing podcasts with comedians because it's always like a just chill chat about whatever. It's there's it's just fun and low pressure. Yeah, yeah. Is it not like that with others? Um some of the people who come on my podcast I feel intimidated by because they're academics and I'm not okay. an academic and Sure, with comedians you're like, oh, <laughs> oh this is fine. <laughs> yeah, like I talk shit. I don't This guy's not overpowering me. I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's funny because they'll look at us like, how do you do that? You know, get on stage and and yeah. try and make people laugh. But I look at them and I'm like, how do you write a book with all of these footnotes? <laughs> and yeah, it seems yeah, yeah. overwhelming. But, but do you find do you find that socially sometimes you're more like you're more you're like more grounded than the intellectuals because they're just so smart. Sometimes. Yeah. Like well, I spoke to them where I'm like, oh, but you you can't even relate to like regular thing you just speak to scientists all day yeah that's so true i think about how alienating it must be to be that smart and i yes. I, I have an uncle who's like a genius he just has a memory for history he knows i feel like two people when they have that that breadth of information about history it gives you such a good perspective on just life and even our current situations and and I wonder, he asks so many questions. He just will start asking you lots of questions. But I also think it's just his way of getting down on like the, the pleb level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he's he's so smart. It just must be it must be hard to to try and find ways to relate to people who aren't just at that level. Sure. I mean, I'm like moderately dumb and like I like <laughs> I struggle with people who are dumber than me. So <laughs> it's like I can't even imagine for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, even the guest I recently had on whose podcast is airing this week, Michael Shermer, he's written so many books. He does um he's has Skeptic magazine. He's just brilliant and I definitely feel like it's a struggle to keep up sometimes when I'm having those conversations, but I learn a lot. I learn, I read their books before I speak to them. So I feel like I'm in, this podcast has become like, I didn't go to college. So it's become my, my inadvertent college. Yeah. This is probably better. I went to college and this is probably better. Where did you go to college? <laughs> like, you're reading books in Long Island. I went to SUNY or Westbury is a, uh, is a SUNY state school. Okay. You and you and your stand up comedy, I saw that you said your parents were immigrants. Where did they, where did they yeah. come from? My parents, my mom and dad were both born in the Dominican Republic. Okay. Um. Yeah. They grew up like a block away from each other. Oh, wow. And yeah, and the, but they didn't know each other. My mom moved to New York when she was like 18 
And then she went back like 20 years later for uh, holidays, holiday parties, see her family, and met my dad, who lived, like, grew up right next door. They just didn't know each other. Oh, wow. Then she married him, and she married him, and they came here. Okay, so are you from New York? Born and raised. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, and I was raised half in Brooklyn, half in Queens. My okay. first half in Brooklyn, then I moved out to Queens. I like Queens a lot, actually. When I was there, even I love like it. I, when I was there, even a de- I think it was maybe over a decade ago. I was staying with some friends in Queens, and I was like, Queens is like the new Brooklyn. <laughs> it's like yes, Brooklyn when I it mean, used to be cool. <laughs> Yes, and to have like a driveway is nice, right? Yeah, and parking that's nice. It's pretty to diverse too. I think it's like the most diverse, yeah, you know, borough per capita in the United States or something like that. It's yes. crazy. Yes, very diverse, and I love it because like now I'm like 15 minutes from Manhattan, but it's still Queens. Like there's still like it's not Manhattan. There's parking. Like it's, it's still a little bit less because I, I, even though I'm a New Yorker, Manhattan can be a lot. Yeah. Can can you yeah. imagine living anywhere else? No. I feel like I can I can see myself maybe getting older and being over it. I can see that part of it. But that's like re- I mean, I feel like that's like more like giving up. That's like retiring, you know, where you're just like <laughs> where you're just like I did it already. I'm done. I'm just going to go do nothing. You're like I I'm giving up on my dreams and I'm going down to like one of those villages in Florida. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, yeah. Well, that's what it is, where you're just like, you're, you're like an NBA player who's like, listen, I did my time, I had a great run, <laughs> now I'm this is what I do out. now. <laughs> yeah. When you went to school, what did you get your degree in? I have a degree in political science. Oh, wow. And economics. Yeah, okay. I was a pre-law major, yeah. Do you do a lot of political commentary in your, in your stand-up? I do almost none. Yeah, I know that's what I. I mean, I've seen the special, but I see. It, yeah. I didn't want to make a judgment on all of your material yeah. based on one, but it seems like you yeah. s- steer away from it. Yeah, I do almost none. I mean, I used to have a couple. Um, I, I always take. I mean, even like in my in the stand up now, I always take kind of like an absurdist view of like every topic starts off like relatively like okay this is something and then goes into like some absurdive like story place but i used to do that with politics but i mean especially like after the 2015 election i just kind of lost all the like love and interest for it like i just completely yeah it's funny because you actually i feel like have the background to be able to tackle that stuff but i can understand i i stumbled into it i came from like not doing not caring about it all to stumbling into making fun of just, I feel like our, like constantly, I'm like, we're living in a South Park. I don't even know how any of this is real. Yeah. Yeah. Which is it, cause it's, I, I mean, I guess you're right. I feel like, I mean, having a degree in politics and following politics for such a long time and doing comedy, you would think that it would be the perfect storm for me. Right. But I still have like a kind of idealistic view of things and especially like politics. Like, I still believe like, we're supposed to be like trying to help people and like we're supposed they're supposed to be like leaders are supposed to be like decent people and like it kind of, it's kind of like at least but at least before like we were making fun of people pretending to be decent and you were like okay well they probably doing this shit but at least they're pretending and then i feel like once people stop pretending to be decent i was like all right well this is not like i don't want any part of this yeah i i feel like i that's really interesting. That's, I guess I never thought any of our leaders were decent. <laughs> sure, but they pretended to be. Right. They, I think they I appreciate a the person on TV. Yeah, they, they pretended to be on TV. Um, well, I mean, I, I feel like there was a, it was like a, a give and a take, right? Because, yeah. I mean, uh, appearances are everything, right? So it's like whatever you're doing in closed behind closed doors, that's like not great. But if it's not out, then is it really even happen like happening, right? And then like if you look at like the way America is looked at globally, right? Like what you put out there is what they see, right? So it's like the leader of China doesn't know that the you know the leader of China, if the president isn't out there doing or saying these things, they don't just assume that he's like. A, a crazy person, right? Yeah, you yeah. Keep that at home. It's like you go to work, you don't just be a crazy person at work. There's definitely a stand-up routine here for you. 
<laughs> about well i, I mean <laughs> no i mean would talk, hate me originally i don't think yeah. so i think like talking about how you come from poli sci and making these jokes about keeping the crazy at home you know <laughs> like it, it's yeah. universal it applies to everyone it's funny like comedians have become this weird flashpoint in this you know, there's so much like gravitas put on the comedian. Like they're supposed to be more than uh, I think we are. Higher standard, higher standard than the president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, I'm like, literally. we're all degenerates. <laughs> Why? Yeah. I mean, literally the president, there's things that the president have said, has said, the former president at least has said in like national television that I couldn't say on the Tonight Show. <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> like 100%. Like oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't be allowed to say it. And he said it in national press conferences. So aired all over the world. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you came from, I always laugh at like, I, I had Nimesh on Patel and all of these kids who are basically like immigrant kids who end up going into comedy and were your yeah. parents okay with it? Or were they were like, ah, shit. They pretended to be cool with it. I knew that at the beginning, I knew they were concerned, but they kind of just took the route of like, well, let's let's let them do like I kind of always been somebody that just figured out what I like. I just figured stuff out. Like I remember when I went to college, like I went to college and I graduated like in four years, like it was pretty in and out like that. That used to be a thing, but it doesn't really happen that much now. Like most people take like five, sometimes six years or take some time off. But I was just like, oh, I'll just go do it. So they were like, well, he's shown that he kind of does accomplish things. So let's just see where he can go. But I remember around like my mid twenties was like the first time where they were like, cause obviously nothing was happening, but they're like, all right, so what are you, are you going to, cause I was supposed to go to law school. So they were like, you mean you've you've been off for four years? Like, are you gonna go to law school? What's going on? Yeah, they're like, is this like phase over? <laughs> phase over, yeah, yeah. Are you right. are you out yeah. of your like I want to be a comedian phase? For sure, for sure. I think they thought. I think it was both. I think they thought it was a phase, and I then I also think they were like, but maybe he'll figure something out. We like we don't know. And then like early on, I had like some family members come see me, like not my parents, but like my sister. And I think my cousin came to see me like fairly early on. So that like my parents, my mom and dad, they started hearing like rumblings throughout the family of like, no, he's funny. Like he's good. And they were just like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up like realizing you wanted to get into comedy? I'm always fascinated with how people stumble onto this path either intentionally or unintentionally yeah i mean honestly like i was just a fan of the art form like i always looked at it as a kid like i always looked at it like with open eyes like wow like they're just talking into the microphone and being funny um i never thought it was something that i could do or would do until probably college um i remember i remember i went to see uh when i was 18 my girlfriend at the time took me to see Chris Rock film Kill the Messenger. Oh wow. Um for, for HBO HBO special taping. Yeah. And uh that was wild because I was just like, wow, this is like it's like stand up at its like highest level. It's yeah. Chris Rock special taping at the Apollo. So it's like at the highest level. But then like I like I was just like, oh man, I would love to do that. But I still didn't think I could. But then like in college, like kind of people kind of telling me, like, hey, you're funny. Like you, you know, I was like kind of like a funny friend or whatever. And they're like, Yeah, you're funny. You should try it. And then I remember in college, I saw a college competition. Like it was like a student comedy competition where I didn't join, but I saw some of my friends join and I saw how they did and it was fine. And I was like, I think I could do that. And then I went to an open mic. Oh, and then you were hooked? Yeah. From the first time I went to an open mic, I was pretty hooked. And how long did it take before you really felt like you were gaining some traction and that you saw a path to making this your living or did you ever doubt doubt yourself or was there never for any sure. doubt? for sure i mean i think my path is a pretty i mean it, it was still i guess if you you depending who you ask and can still be interpreted as like a fast i was still i moved on pretty fast but when you're going through it doesn't feel fast like i was doing open mics for three years and you know it took me a while and also like things 
don't seem fast because like it's all on the back. Like once the train gets going, then it's fast. But it to get to the first point, it took seven years, probably. I would say the first time I did I did uh the tonight show, that was probably the first time where I was like, Okay, things are happening. Yeah, you have credit. Like, yeah, things are happening. Yeah. yeah. That was like my first TV credit. And I had done a comedy central uh uh set a couple like weeks but like uh, months before the tonight show so i was like all right the momentum the momentum is going so i did like comedy central set then i did the tonight show and then right after that i filmed a short set for hbo like i did all that in like a year wow so i was like okay and then the pandemic hit (laughs) (laughs) i was just gonna say is this the part where you're like and then the pandemic hit (laughs) yeah yeah then the pandemic hit i think about all you guys like Ah, oh, there were so many people I knew who had so much momentum, particularly in the comedy space going into 2020. And I know, I just think about this all the time, the momentum that got lost in in that time period for people in all kinds of industries, all kinds of places in their life. You have that ball that you've been pushing, pushing, pushing for decades, and then yeah. everything shuts down. Yeah. Well, at the time, I definitely felt like that. At the time, I felt like I've lost all momentum. Like, this is like the worst. I mean, I've been working at that point. I was working nine years to get to that point, eight, nine years to get to that point, And now this. But, you know, at the, you remember that time, everyone was dealing with so much more serious stuff that I didn't even care. I was just like, whatever. Like, I just stopped doing stuff. Whatever. It is what it is. It, it wasn't until, like, things started slowing down that I was kind of like, okay, wow, the momentum is 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 gone for me. But to be honest, it did not slow the momentum down at all. Like, when things started to open up, like, I was right back. I was pretty much right back where I left off. And the same, uh, you know, people, I, I thought people would forget like all the thing I was doing, but, uh, I feel like when things opened up there, people were like, oh yeah, we didn't forget. Are you a road comic or do you stick more to New York city? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a road guy. Like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm the, I'm both like, I'm a New Yorker. I'm in all the clubs in New York when I'm here, but I'm also on the road like most weekends. Wow. What's your favorite yeah. part of being on the road? Um, I like the excitingness of coming in. I, I, I mean, I feel like on the road, like when you do a, a regular road weekend, like a Thursday, let's say Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I feel like the dynamic of like, it's like a, a, a relationship kind of, or maybe like a life, like, cause you get there on Thursday, right? And then on Thursday, you usually have one show and then you're like this thing on Thursday where you're like this new person in the city and like the wait staff hasn't seen you and yeah. like the thing like the club is new you don't know how the mic works like not how it works but you don't know if the sound is good you're like where's the light the manager's like am, you're like am i allowed to eat it so you don't know the thing and then you do your show thursday and then friday you're like okay i'm getting used to it like like thing on first show you're like all right i did one yesterday i know and then by the second show you feel like all right I'm cooking. I know how this club. Then Saturday comes, and that's prime time. That's the show, like 8 p.m. Saturday. And then you do the late show um, Saturday, and then it's like relationship is done. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, on on to the next one. I'm moving on. So <laughs> I feel like it's. I'm excited about. Like I get excited about that tonight because literally by Saturday second show, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm ready to get on my flight tomorrow morning and go back home. But then like today is Tuesday. I leave on Thursday. I'm looking forward to Thursday. Where are you going Thursday? Uh, to Michigan, Ann Arbor. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you have favorite places in America that you go, or is it just every places? Well, for me, like for a long time, like before I had, you know, the credits or was able to like sell any type of tickets, I remember the rooms I would do were just so bad. It was just like B, C, sometimes D rooms. Um, and now over the past, like, let's say six to eight months has been like the first time where I'm able to like break into like these A rooms, which makes me look at like cities differently. Like, cause normally I would go into a city and you do a C room in the city, which it's usually the C room is not in the best part of the city. Right. That's why it's a C room. So you, and if you don't have a car, you're just there. You think this is the city, but then you move to an A room and you're like, oh, this city is nice. Like this city has a. (laughs) bustling downtown area people have teeth this is great (laughs) it's such this is great it's such a grind i mean i love i love talking to comedians just because this this podcast was started just to talk to people about grit and resilience and i really the comedy grind is a true grind it's 
I've always said, I just don't think I'm, I love the stage. I love comedy. I don't think I'm cut. I don't think I'm made for that grind. I've always felt like it was, I just didn't have it in me to grind like that because it's just so the late nights. It and, is. Uh, I mean, for sure. And like, I, I feel like also for like, I don't even know as like, a woman like how difficult it is because like as a man i'm like this is so sketchy like i don't want to be in this car with this club owner like he's creepy he's creeping me out and i'm a guy <laughs> and it, it's like i can't even imagine like a woman sitting next to like some creepy uh club owner as he's like telling you jokes and talking about like how much he knows about kind con- and you're just like oh my god this is so <laughs> it's like when you used to have to buy weed and like talk to your weed dealer for an hour yeah <laughs> just yeah, like yeah. oh god yeah. okay and then I'll I've, put done up some, with this. I've done some i've done some I've done some brutal ones. Like I remember I did a gig one time. This was like maybe five years ago in Kansas City where it was sold as a comedy club. It was honestly a back room at an Indian restaurant. And the <laughs> guy, like I was told that I would be staying in like an Airbnb, but it was literally the the room next door to the owner's oh, in his gosh. house. <sighs> so it's like I and it, you know, it's not like a fancy house by any means. It's like an old creepy house. Like I literally slept in my clothes like on top of the bed for the whole weekend. From Friday, from the moment I got there Friday, I just could not wait to leave on Saturday. Like I never took my clothes off because I was just, he had a he had a cat that had fur, like it was fur all over my bed, all over the, the house. And uh, the guy was like a nice guy, but I was just like, I remember telling my agent at the time, I was like, I, I can't keep doing this. Yeah. Like I, ra- I rather stay in New York than do this because this is miserable. Yeah, I, I, I definitely started as, as my, I hit like a weird point in comedy where I started focusing more on building the online audience, which turned out to be a great idea right before the pandemic, and then it became strange because as that audience grew, promoting my shows was like the only time that I was locating myself. I started becoming just hyper aware of putting my location out there and that is sketchy to me having to promote your shows and you're like i'm just going to this place and here everyone knows now online (laughs) like here's where i'm gonna be which right as a woman is sketchy picture it yeah i can't picture because for me for me it's like i get a ton of like sketchy messages from both men and women like like people like people message me like hey i'm coming to your, your show tonight saw you're staying at this hotel do you want to dr-? and i'm like how did you see i'm staying at that hotel yeah no that that kind of <laughs> stuff is so creepy and unsettling right. and i yeah. i know male comedians who deal with that and i'm like yeah imagine now you're a one i mean the women who have made it in this industry they're really just something else because it's the other thing too is just I'm like, how do these? There's a reason it's such a boys' club. I feel just because I don't want to get on stage and be funny when I'm bleeding, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Sure, I want to be sure. like on my couch crying. Sure, <laughs> I don't want to sure. be putting myself out there. And I just the women who have done it are I admire them so much because they. I feel like you have to overcome so much just in terms of, you know, your safety and like you said, sketchiness. But then also I felt internally it was always a battle when I wasn't like depending on where my freaking cycle I was. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's it's so much. I mean, because like I said, I, I feel like universally, like I look at the same way as men. I'm like, I don't know, you know, how you do it, but you kind of just I don't know. I feel like. Sometimes I look back at the things and I'm just like, I, I can't believe I did that, but you kind of just do it and it just become, you, you, I guess it, 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 you become part of this fraternity of yeah. like people who've been through hell, you know, <laughs> to try to <laughs> pursue a fashion. There is that, that sense of camaraderie. I mean, there's also the weird, I've been watching, I've never seen Band of Brothers. My husband's been like, prom, prom, I promised him I would watch it with him. I just... I was like, it's not like I don't like things like this. They just make me really sad. 
And there is this camaraderie of men who have been through war, but I was like, it's different with comedians because they're also super competitive <laughs> with one another. <laughs> so there's this camaraderie, but you, I also feel like there's a healthy competition in the comedy world. Yeah. Well, honestly, I found that in New York and like I started here and I've always, there's always been my home. I don't really see that like super competitiveness. That's good. Of it. I mean, I guess you do see it, but the guys who like live like that, they're always kind of like, people are like, yeah, I don't know what's his, I don't know why he's so competitive. <laughs> like, <laughs> this isn't that. Cause I guess, because I guess I'm like kind of around like at the clubs in New York, it, people are successful, right? So it's like, it's it, they're not that competitive because they're like, I'm doing fine, you know? So so I don't see it, but then I guess you do see it in, in like in the ancillary scenes of like, People like, oh, why did he get this and not, you know? Yeah, I think it's, I feel like there's a um, scarcity mentality, you know, that, that there's, because you are, you're kind of fighting for stage time, you're fighting for, it is a grind and a hustle, but I do think ultimately my my belief has always been like there's room for us all, especially in comedy where everyone has such a different perspective and you hone your voice and it's hopefully unique. You know, you hope that your perspective is only you've lived your life. Only you can tell jokes in the way that you're going to tell jokes. And I think that that's what makes comedy so awesome is you can have 10 people ta talk about the same topic and it'll be very different if, especially as you get up into those higher levels of comedians who have been doing it. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I would agree. So, and also, but I, and I think like a little competitiveness also good, right? Totally. And not like in the, like, why did he get that? And I didn't more like, man, I wish I would have came up with that bit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's your, you talk about relationships a lot in your stand up. Yeah. where, where, yeah. what is your relationship life like now currently? For the special, it was like, it was a culmination of like a lot of stories. Obviously, it's like a special, like it wasn't built in a year. It was built in honestly dating through my all my 20s. Um, and then I, like now I have somebody who I'm dating and, I, you know, it, it, it was weird because the special came out and then like the special was all this single stuff. And then I kind of have to be like, hey, I, I'm, I, I know I'm pushing this single stuff, but this is just like the special stuff. Right. This is not like I'm not this is not like where I am. This is just where the material was when it got created. So now I have to like push it out. And I feel like I kind of had to explain to her, like, let me let this like thing clear out. And then, I'll, you know, because it's like I also try to like when I'm dating someone, I try not to like I try not to like speak about our current problems. Yeah. Like, also, all of the relationship stuff is like in hindsight. Like, yeah, so it's like, yeah. If I tell a relationship story, it's always not, it's never my girlfriend at the time. Yeah. I give them that respect. So, but then they're like, if you talk about like your single time, they're like, but why don't you speak about us? And it was like, because then I'd have to speak about you. Yeah, yeah. I always <laughs> say that when I was writing for Playboy, I was like, if I'm telling a story, yeah. it's in hindsight. It's not, yes. I'm not, if I'm writing about a man, he's in my rear view mirror. He's not in yeah. my current life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, cause I, I think that's, I mean, some, I think some people, I think people pretend to be cool with it, but like sometimes like your partner will pretend to be cool with it, but it's a little weird. Like no matter what, it's a little weird. Like I had, like I had somebody who wrote a, a book and she put me in the book and I, she didn't like use my name. She didn't use, there's nothing that would lead it back to me, but she sent me the thing about it. And even me as a comedian who put people in my stuff, I was like, this is still weird. <laughs> <laughs> This is so weird. I was like, fine, but I was like, this is, it still feels a little weird. Yeah, I I feel that way. I've always I've always been, I, and this is just my own personal thing. And I've talked to comedians about it when I know they're in relationships and they're joking about the relationship and like their significant other is there. I always feel like I'm watching a couple fight and I'm just in the living room with them. Even if it's totally fine, it's I'm always like, uh, and yeah. I think and I mean, and it's weird. I think it's weird. <laughs> I'm an entertainer. I still think it's weird. I mean, I, you see couples like, like guy will go up there. My girlfriend's such an idiot. And then the girlfriend will go up there. My guy's a piece of shit. And you're just like, I don't know. How, you guys have the strongest relationship 
<laughs> I've never seen because I don't know many relationships that will be able to handle that. I find too that my just for me, my comedy, it's almost like music. Like the, my music kind of predicts where I'm headed. My mood is headed or something, whatever I'm listening to. And then I'll look back and be like, oh, that's why I was obsessed with that song. But a lot of the comedy, I feel like the bits that I do jokingly end up it's there's like some truth I'm working out in my subconscious. I've done jokes about trying to freeze my eggs and being, you know, being like, oh, that's stupid. And and people kind of pitied me. I could never get the bit to work. And I have a kid now. She's like a miracle kid. And I was like, oh, I understand so much more about why that bit didn't work. And also they were picking up on something in me that I had no access to at that time, which was yes. like a desire for a child. <laughs> and they were yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah. and I was like, hey, it's uh, fine, yeah. guys. I'm fine. And they're like, you're not fine. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you're actually not yeah. fine. And I've had friends who have yeah. joked about their marriage or whatever, and they're like, I'm, and then that's when we're going to get divorced. And then they end up getting divorced. I think even yeah, like I mean, Ali Wong went through like, this Ali recently. Wong, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ali Wong. Yeah. Which I which by the way, like I saw Ali Wong special and as like I got it as a work of art. Like I got it. Like it, I thought it was masterful because she spent 30 minutes talking about why she wants to get a divorce. And then the next 30 minutes talking about why she wouldn't divorce him. Right. But from seeing it, I remember I was like, ugh. I don't She's know. gonna get a divorce. This is, this is, yeah, yeah. This is, this, is, this is a lot to hear. I thought it was a masterful special, but I was like, this is gonna take a lot to think. So, I mean, I've had sometimes I've had like girlfriends who's like, again, I don't use no one's real name or likeness. Like, you would never know who it was unless you're that person, or unless that person has told that story to other people that it happened to them, right? But I've had stories where they'll hit me up. They're like, first of all, this is not how it happened. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to be entertaining. I'm not just trying to retell a story exactly how it happened, right? So I have to like embellish. I have to change some things around. Yeah. I'm not one of those like comedians that's like, oh, everything is 100% exactly how it happened. I'm like, yeah. no, no, I'm being entertaining. I'm trying to entertain the crowd. Yeah. I mean, that's like one of the things I've said to comedians, particularly around this time when people were comedians were saying things on Twitter and then they'd be like, no, I actually meant this. And I'm like, stop, stop trying to defend what stupid shit you were saying. Defend your right to stay, stay stupid shit. Defend your right to be hyperbolic. You know, you don't need to be accurate. You're not a CNN reporter. You just need, you, you can be hyperbolic for the sake of being hilarious. Oh, I think the problem is created because there are comedians that are like, these aren't jokes. No, it's like These activism. Are, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, even, even, even there is the activism <laughs> part, but there's also comedians that's like, I'm speaking, I'm just, this is the truth. Like, they're like, they don't even, I guess their character, like part of their character thing is to like pretend that whatever story they're telling is a hundred percent, like take me a hundred percent as I'm saying it. Like, um, I feel like it, it, you see it a lot in like the urban scene. Um, cause like the urban scene of comedy, they don't really, um, uh, like they're very literal. Like they're, they're, they're it, like that's it's kills so hard because they're very literal. They don't really do like nuance or like a thing. So like a lot of the comedians are like, I'm not joking. These aren't jokes. These are you know they're they're being serious. So then people is like, oh well, then when you tweeted this, was that a, like that's not a joke then? Right. You were saying that you don't tell jokes. That's interesting. That's why I'm like, hey, I'm I'm joking on everything. Like everything is a joke. Not, I also <laughs> think people are just. I go the opposite. Yeah, every I I find too like online on Twitter. I'll, I it used to be fun, and now uh, since like 2015, everyone's brains just broke, and then even more so over the pandemic. But I'll tweet something so innocuous or something that's meant to be tongue in cheek, and every single person. I, even something that's not even a joke. Like wh the other day, I was like, single mom, single parents, I don't know how you do it. You all deserve awards. Just an innocuous, stupid thought I had because I was feeding- Back backlash? <laughs> people were like, people who are married, actually, they put- actually maybe not all the parents is, i was like you're all fucking autistic every one of you on this oh, site oh is God. autistic <laughs> like, well i mean for me like even like, it's funny you mentioned like, that because like why the special, do you take everything literally exactly actually, like, i feel the same way about this special like the special 
a lot of the material is like tongue in cheek. Like yeah. I'm kidding. I'm exaggerating. I'm like, like to so some of the stuff, like I had men getting upset with me where I'm like, where I'm like women control dating. Like that's like a line, but it's like tongue in cheek. Like I'm just, I'm kidding. Like I'm, I'm, no one controls dating. Dating is hot. You know, it's, it's two people, but I'm like, oh, women are in charge. We, and they're like, why are you saying women are in charge? And it's like these, like, it was like a lot of like incel <laughs> energy of like, women don't deserve to be in charge. They don't deserve nothing. And I'm like, yeah, like, <laughs> okay, simmer down men's rights activists. You're yeah, going to be right, fine. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's wild. Like you really can't say anything without there being like a faction of people who's like, actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. It's... And also it's like you don't understand like and, and especially I feel like it's so it's it's tongue in cheek cuz it's like I'm mocking. It's a, I'm mocking both of the things. Like I'm mocking the male like perspective, the male ego, and I'm also mocking women being in charge now. Like yeah. it's not like it's not a literal thing <laughs> like Every I know it's very strange that we live in this time where everyone takes everything so literally. I don't know when we slid into that. And I'm I'm older, like I'm a Gen X kid, so I don't take anything. We grew up in sarcasm and satire, and it was just laced with everything that sardonic, dry humor is something I appreciate so much. I grew up reading Calvin and Hobbes and the far side, like this is the kind of comedy looking at the world through that absurdist le lens and trying to regurgitate it in in a time when I always say like parody has become reality. It It's so hard to mock something that's so absurd and you end up having to be almost absurd to the point of being literal in order yes. to even mock it. But maybe that's why everyone takes everything <laughs> literally. But yet... But yet, at the same token, the president of the United States can say something from the desk of the president and people will say, well, he was joking. <laughs> yeah, the well, that's the thing is that everyone will use it to defend. They'll be like, oh, they'll use the he was joking as a defense of their favorite people. But yeah, people who right. are actually paid to do jokes. Yeah, I was like, well, I get paid to joke. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're being serious. You're undermining. Like, no, this is serious. <laughs> you're undermining men. Yeah, Don't you right. think men yeah. have it hard enough? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's which that's like hilarious. Like, I mean, I guess you see it now with uh, the internet. And listen, everything has a, a there's a swing back right so every movement has a swing back you know and i understand like the me too movement happened which was like needed or whatever it, like deserved and needed but then there's like a, the backlash is like these group of men that was like well we've had it unfair this whole time and you're like i didn't even know this was an angle that you were allowed to take <laughs> like i thought <laughs> i thought we had just agreed that it was easier to be a man. Yeah. Like, I just thought that was like a, a general <laughs> consensus, but it's not. Nope. I learned this writing for Playboy, actually, because I had been, I hadn't been very online. I was waiting tables and had jobs where you, you know, had to be like in the world. And I just hadn't been online. And I started writing for Playboy. And one of the earlier pieces I did was, um, it was very tongue in cheek, but kind of serious. And I think it's, again, we all grew up with like John Stewart. So he walks that line of like, I'm being jokey, but I'm being serious. And then when people come at him, he's like, I'm joking. And it's a, it's a little bit of a cheap thing we get to do, but we still get to do it. And this piece was um, women date assholes because you're a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought I didn't realize like how many men and women would get mad at me for that piece. <laughs> but so yeah. many, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I certainly wasn't online enough to know that I couldn't use terms like real man. Cause I was saying like, Oh, like you're, I, I wrote about like the signs of, of being like a beta male and I just people, but then the guys in the men's rights activists came after me too. So I had like feminists coming after me saying that I had internalized all this misogyny and I had the men's rights activists coming after me saying like women, you know, there's that I was an alpha widow and all this jargon I had never men's heard of. Men's rights activists. Like that's, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't know we were fighting for rights. Honestly, like I'm, I'm aware now. I thought, I thought like we pretty much had them. I, I didn't know that. But like you know, and I, I don't want to seem like a traitor. I just didn't know. <laughs> You're like I was unaware. We didn't. Yeah, I didn't know there were rights that we we needed still. But I, I, I think it's like kind of the same thing. <laughs> I think it's kind of the same thing of like sometimes I've hear I've heard arguments like there was like civil rights, like black and minority civil rights, and and then there's a pushback from like white people who are like no we're being like persecuted and you're like what <laughs> like you are i didn't even know this was a a, a thing but it kind of in a funny way i feel like it just goes to show how much we're all human yeah yeah like, we are we we all are just pulling for the same things like yeah. we're all just humans no matter what we're more humans than we are logical yeah Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Be sure to check out my weekly podcast, You're Welcome with Michael Malice, now on Podcast One. You might know me from my terrible Twitter, my horrible books, or the nonsense I spout on podcasts like Rogan and Glenn Beck. It's all there. Are you black-pilled or white-pilled for the future of the UK? What is a man? <laughs> what is a man? What is a no? I, what is the, I, are you white pilled or black pilled? No seriousness, girl. No, 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 I love the Jesse B. Piece of question. The fact that you discovered that gives me hope for some of the things that I've still got that are well, missing. Well, if you need James G. Blaine's autograph, you are welcome to it. Of course, being the co author of How to Have Impossible Conversations makes you the perfect guest for this train wreck of a show. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> new episodes are available every Thursday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, and wherever you get your podcasts. You are welcome. I was always very worried about the the uh, like you know how you said the pendulum swings, and I, and when it was like a lot of my friends comedians out here, we would we would talk about this where we're like, ah, oh, I'm not sure about this backlash to like we don't really want white people being like white lives matter <laughs> you know like the, like i feel like that back i like we we've, we've kind of gotten away from that we don't want to be like triggering that that little like manchurian <laughs> candidate in everyone's mind <laughs> i mean that's like a perfect example of like forget about like you think about the organization and whatever you want to say but like most people don't care about the like blm organization most people just say it as like hey black people shouldn't be killed right and then <laughs> some white people like white people shouldn't be killed and the black people was like wait what <laughs> like we didn't even know we don't even know how to <laughs> you're like wait no yeah we agree. like no that's one should be saying. killed saying, yeah yeah that's what we're saying we're saying no one should be killed <laughs> And they're like, no, but why? And you're, and you're just like, all right, I don't know. No, we're, just, we're all humans. We'll never. <laughs> yeah, that I there's a really there's a lot of great books. And I've I've read about the way we kind of got away from this tribalism and to a certain extent with democracy and America being this kind of miracle and how it's the way in the West that we've lived is not the standard operating procedure for humanity for pretty much all of time. It's quite rare other than some other blips in history, but usually it's like tribalism, brutality, all of this horrible stuff. And I, I feel like I, you know, there's a lot of really much smarter people than me are like, we, we can't allow this to, take over our brains again <laughs> and like we've done a good job of trying to keep this in check and we can't it, but it is like I mean, our default I setting has. i think it has like i think we've we're too far we can't pull it back <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're there back to the dark ages we're, i mean we're there like you said you the fact that you saying single women deserve a prize and that's like that gets backlash like that's like yeah no, it's like uh, all these people were like, and what about the parents who stay married? They deserve medals. I'm like, okay, everyone gets a fucking medal. You all get yeah, medals. I mean, all lives matter. Yes, I get <laughs> all lives matter. <laughs> yes. It was. Okay. Get, all, right. all right. Everyone gets a medal. I, all lives I matter. Guess, yeah. You can't say anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's, there's it's, people that like somebody like you think about like somebody like Barack Obama would tweet like, God bless America. Like that's the tweet. God bless. And then the comments would be like, oh yeah, you bastard. Well then, and you're like, maybe if you weren't from Africa. 
<laughs> Shouldn't it be God bless like, oh, Africa, you traitor? Right. Or yeah, you're like who? But also, my thing is the internet is like a whole nother world. And I ask like, because I go in the street, because sometimes I'll 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 say it. I'm like, I'll even say it at shows. I'm like, who are these people? They're here. Like some of these people are here, but but none of you will pretend that it's you. But some of you are here. Like some of you are in here. You go on YouTube videos and you leave bad comments. Yeah. And I want to know why do you do that? It reminds me of that South Park episode where one of the kids' dads and he was like this horrible piece of shit online at night and he would just be like out in the world. And I think about all the time I'll be just in line at the grocery store or somewhere and I'm like, this motherfucker yeah, could have... Yeah. yeah, this person could have been yeah. like, Michelle Obama has a dick, <laughs> you know? like, yeah. And they're yeah. just buying coffee. Like, yeah, and they're just buying coffee, and they'll say like "Good morning." Yeah, you know, they'll be like "Good morning," and then just buy a coffee, and just like "Have a nice day," and, and then go back and this. tell me to kill myself. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> People will literally look at your comedy, not like it because it's not their sense of humor, which is fine, and then suggest that you end your life. <laughs> <laughs> How crazy is this? No, it is a crazy. crazy it's this world that we live in. No, it is. Which is they'll why they'll tweet at you. They'll they'll tweet at you. Like they'll put it like, out. Yeah, that's like texting your phone. Like they will be like at Ian Lara Live. Your comedy sucks. You should kill yourself. <laughs> and then you and then you'll just get it. And then you'll just be like having a conversation with like your cousin. And then you're just like, all right. <laughs> Somebody thinks I should kill myself. This is crazy. Yeah. No, it really is like such a strange time. Uh, the person I interviewed last week for the podcast, she is like a very online 30-year-old. She considers herself an in internet historian. Her name is Catherine D. And she's like, yeah, there's no difference between online and off. I, she kind of seamlessly transitions between the two. And I, I do think that after everybody got locked up, they there was something that eroded, like they forgot how to behave in in real life because they they started internalizing that mean person that they were online when you can just drive by say mean stuff. I get the instinct. I've I've definitely done it. Um, I mean, I've thought these things, but yeah. I'm a human being, and so I don't need to. I've th I, I, I've seen comedy. I'm like, this sucks, but I never thought. Let me tweet at the guy to murder to say he should end his life and <laughs> <laughs> it's just insane and i feel like it's not the same though like because somebody i read i think i was somebody maybe might have been a tweet but somebody suggested that it would be a better the world would be a better place if on the internet you had to like show your id to like log on and leave comments you'd have to put like your photo and like who you are next to every comment you couldn't picture put like a rant because people hide behind these these things you know and it's like and like sometimes you'll get threatened, like people will threaten, and I'm like, I've never been threatened in real life, <laughs> but like I've been threatened on the internet. Yeah, yeah, like, no. People it, be like, yeah, I'll come and I'll kill you. Yeah, yeah. I've I always say like the right threatens to kill you, and the left th wants you to kill yourself. Like that's been my experience yeah. of online. As I get the yeah, death threats yeah. from the right and the left is like, just kill yourself. You're garbage. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm like yeah. why is everyone Which is like, threatening to kill it's me? So tribal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so, it's such like a tribal thing. I feel like comedians, for the most part, most people we exist in like this middle. But even comedians got split with the tribalism when a lot of this stuff had went down. Like some comedians pulled completely to one side and some completely to the other side, and then a lot of us were left in the middle. Like what? Like I thought we were like making fun of both of these sides. Everyone. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was a just equal opportunity, make fun of you. That, yeah, we still try and do that on my show, Dumpster Fire, and on YouTube, and we and I mostly take aim at myself because I find self deprecating humor to be my favorite, and I do find like it's it is like that weird. I I don't know. I've just always thought of our role as like trickster in mythology. Yeah. You know, we're supposed yeah. to be, it's like he, he, there's a great quote about tricksters and it's he who dupes others and who also dupes himself. You know, that himself, yeah. I just think we're supposed to be shapeshifters a little bit and, and take on a, take a position that we might not even wholeheartedly agree with in order to reveal people's, 
hidden paradigms and and things that they believe that they didn't even know they necessarily believe. It's like it's how why people laugh. It's like when you start doing comedy and you're learning about it, it's like the nod is that when you're t- doing the setup and they're like, okay, I agree. And the laugh is that truth that they, they, they're they feeling or being revealed. And it's not always obvious. That's why great com- comedy is is like sleight of hand and, and jokes that do turns and take you to places yes. that you're not expecting. But, yeah. yeah. I think for me, like the, one of the weirdest things when the whole thing happened is like, Watching like a, like watching some comedians become super successful, catering to people that had views that I knew for a fact they didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> that was strange to me. <laughs> but I was like, I've known him his whole life. He has no problems with trans people. I don't know why he's saying these things. You know, like I, like that was like. But they're like, well, these are the fans, and you got to feed the, the shot. You know, these are the guys that these people buy tickets to hear you regurgitate the stuff that they believe. Somebody needs to do it. So they're like, why not? I'll take the money. I wonder if they like their fans. No, they don't. Like, I know them. I ask them. They hate them. (laughs) Like, they'll never say this publicly. These are the people paying for their stuff. But, like, I know for the general part, like, I know a lot of, like, big name comedians who are like, no, I hate my fans. They're the worst people. I'd rather have less fans that I liked than more fans that I hated and a lot of money. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm saying that because that's rather... exactly the place I find myself in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I might rather, I'd rather have the fans that hate. Because you know one thing about the one thing about like angry type of fans is like when you have like an angry pers- point of view, like you're willing to pay a lot of money to have that point of view validated. As opposed to like, I feel like one side, if you're if your stance is like everyone should be able to live peacefully. I feel like sometimes you're just like, yeah, this is just a regular state. I just think everyone should be able to live peacefully. You're less likely to like invest in like that's a that's a normal thought to you. But if your thought is like, no, these people should be put aside and not allowed to have rights, and there's somebody else that uh, tell you, hey, hey, I have that idea too. You're willing to pay large sums of money to be to visit or do go wherever that person is going to tell you that your stance isn't crazy. Yeah. This is everywhere online. I mean, all, yeah. all there's no, no lack of people wanting their perspective validated, and any perspective yeah. can be Same. validated. Yes, any any perspective. Yeah, any there's any no, perspective. There's no perspective too crazy for no. the internet. There are flat earthers, thousands of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you kidding me? That's like mainstream. That's like a mainstream point of view. <laughs> It's like that's like that's like politics. That like some people believe the Earth is round, some people believe it's flat. Like that's like we coexist. That's not even a controversial thing to say anymore. Yeah, one of the things we talk about a lot on this podcast that comes up constantly, although it hasn't really come up with a comedian, which is why it's interesting to explore it with you. It's more usually with people in media as we talk a lot about audience capture. This idea when you have your own brand and your writing and. Uh, A lot of people I've interviewed have pivoted kind of out of their prestige mainstream establishments and into their own brand building. Like, uh, let's take Glenn Greenwald, for an example. He and I had a great conversation about this and how do you avoid audience capture? And for for me, I always I always joke like on Twitter, I'm I'm like, I'll only disappoint you. And my I say, like, you say something that maybe gets you a lot of followers in one direction and then you have to immediately like you have to, yeah, yeah. make a I joke. I find the great comedians, the great comedians do that. Like they'll see that coming and they'll just go the opposite way. Yeah. Like, and they'll just keep going back and forth on the opposite way. I think Burr does a pretty good job of that where he'll be like, you know, sometimes on his his stand-ups, he'll be like, I, I'm, I'm not going where you think I'm going <laughs> before, yeah, before Burr, you start I mean, clapping. He's genius. I mean, Burr is just a genius. And it's so funny. I remember like early on, this was like maybe a, a two, year, two, three years before the pandemic. I was I was headlining a show in New York and Burr just happens to come by. He was filming a movie and, and I had never met him. And I'm like, oh my God, Burr, do you want to go up? And he was like, no, you go, you do your set. And I'm like, but I'm headlining. I'm doing 50 minutes. He's like, it doesn't matter. Just do your set. And then you bring me up. 
And I did it, and like in my home, and my like I'm doing a show, and I'm like, this audience doesn't even know that I'm bringing up Bill Burr at the end of this. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Hey. So like, so yeah, so I bring him up, and it's Burr working out. So it's like these crazy points of views, but he doesn't have the <laughs> no, turn yet. No. He like when he's building, he doesn't have. The I've turn seen yet. this so, in real life, and it's so amazing. It is. It could get ugly. Yeah. You know? it, it, it is ugly. Yeah. I saw. And him then do, you go on to see the special, and you're like, "This is genius." Yeah. I saw him. I've seen him do a bit. I think he finally got it, but it was like two specials later. But I watched him walk people out of the audience trying to work out a bit that he didn't have the turn yet yeah. and like people yeah. were just getting up leaving because it just sounded misogynist yeah that happened <laughs> that happened yeah that happened to me i mean my audience is like you know a bunch of young millennials and a lot of like women and stuff and they and yeah i mean i i remember i think this is when he was working out the i told women to stay in the kitchen like i think he just had that line he didn't even have where it was going he just had that line which I turned this. out to be like a great funny bit Cause he's a master at what he does, but at that point it was like, I like eye opening to see like, yep. like him working it out. Yeah, it was. I remember seeing that and being like, "Wow, it's good to know even he can like piss off enough people that they'll just like get up and leave." Yeah, <laughs> because he but was. But then I've seen him like he's not like the white guy comic because I've seen him piss off that those guys. Like I've yeah. seen him piss off the. He doesn't care. No, no, no. He's so yeah. He's probably. I saw him trying to work out what I think is like one of his most genius and really insightful and and talk about like promotive bits. The one that he does about Kanye, where he was like, racism sometimes works, but he didn't quite have it yet. And people, were, you can yeah. see the audience like had no idea how to respond. They were like, yeah. what is happening right yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I mean, and he's he's built up like such good. I feel like equity. I mean, he has like a black wife and his black daughter. <laughs> you know, he can like, say what he thinks, but he's also a genius. He's just like so masterful, which I think that's like the mark of like. And I think you know people are great regardless, but I think that's like the mark of like a true legend is like going back and forth, like kind of towing the line back and forth of like I'm not. You're not gonna capture me, kind of. Yeah, like, I'm like no one owns you, me. You, yeah, yeah, no, no one owns me. Yeah. Which, and, and this business is so easy for us to get owned because we try so hard to make any type of like living that as soon as we get it, we're just like, all right, this is where I make it. I, I've tried 10, 15 years to make it play in the middle, but I, I, I can't make So I got to go this way. Okay. Yeah. What's your, um, what is like your kind of dark night of the soul have you had in this, in, in the struggle to get some traction in this industry? I don't know. I feel like I've always, I, of course, you know, in the beginning you have your thing where you're like, why doesn't anyone like me? Why, you know, you I'm have still that there, by the way. Every, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, do they not see, do they not see what I can do? But in hindsight, <laughs> they weren't wrong. I don't think they were wrong. I think, I mean, I feel like as comedians, we, yeah, as comedians, we generally look back in hindsight and we'll be like, oh yeah, that thing that passed up on me. I don't think they were wrong <laughs> at that time. Um, I've gotten better since then. So I, you know, and I kind of has like good people who I admired kind of in my ear a lot and saying like, Hey, this is part of the process. You have to stay down, keep doing the work. Don't let the thing, don't worry about that. It doesn't matter. This is insignificant. So I, I, I was able, every time I felt like I was getting off that track, I was able to kind of get pulled back on. Yeah, that's great. I, I have, we have this ongoing joke on our YouTube show where I'm always like, where are my accolades? <laughs> and it's it's kind of just, a, it's partially true, but it's partially like, I, I'm, I'm usually just happy to be here and happy to do what I want to do. And then with the internet, it's always tough because I'm dealing with like algorithms and I never know if I'm saying things, it's like triggering the, you know, trolls who guard the bridge and give you access to success or if it's just maybe not I because I believe if something is funny people will share it so you just you just have to keep going and somebody said something to me yesterday that I thought was great where it's like when you hit those plateaus it forces you to just evaluate and dig a little deeper and do more work or see how you can make something better or more efficient or um pivot in a different direction it's just those plateaus are good for you 
For sure. And I think also like sometimes it's important to remember like nobody cares like we think they care. Cause we think that like we think like, oh, this person told me to uh jump off a bridge. This person must really care or hate me. And it's like, no, nah, they don't. Like if you go speak to them, they're like, What? Oh, I just say I just tweeted that. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> yeah, no, care. that was like a drive by. It's like they don't Yeah, yeah. Like, they, they don't care. Like no one is like watching like we think that people are like watching our work. And even when you get backlash, like I've done podcasts where like you start to, you look at the comments and people are like, who is this guy stuck? But it's like, those people will walk right by you on the street and not know who you are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What is your biggest defect of character? I, I, I feel like I just saw a hurricane of flaws like came to my mind. Like it was just like a whirlwind <laughs> of like why I'm shitty and I couldn't grasp on. Like, I couldn't grasp one? on to like one to one, yeah, one real reason. Um, um, I don't know. Like I was having someone once said to I me, think, What is it? Was it it might have been who was it? it might have been Byron Bowers, who was like, Is it what I think or what my girlfriend thinks? <laughs> that's exactly what I was about to say. I was just about to go there. I was like, I was having an ar a, a, a argument last night where it's like, I don't know, I find Cause I don't, I'm, I don't really follow the horoscope stuff like that, but like girls are always like, Oh, I'm a Virgo. They're like, Oh, this is such a Virgo thing of years where you're like, um, I, I, you know, I Virgos can be very perfectionalist. I, I think like I'm a perfectionist and I hold myself to like extremely high standards. And sometimes you hold other people to those standards and that comes off as like judgmental or holier than thou traits. So I think that's probably a common one that I hear, which is like, um, you, you know, you, your judgment to people because we're all like i said we're all humans we all have the same flaws so like we do stuff that are bad and we don't really want to hear other people telling us it's bad and i'm the kind of person that like i'll be like oh no that's bad right and that's it <laughs> and you're like people don't want to hear that yeah 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 that's a good one um what's your biggest asset i think i'm like a i think i'm like a genuinely like kind-hearted person like i don't really have any like hate or desire to hurt or harm anybody like, <laughs> you're not telling people to kill themselves online <laughs> well online is different that's a different guy <laughs> i'm a different guy there but no yeah like i don't have any like real desire like to harm or hurt anybody i kind of just want everyone to live along each other amicably yeah i like that i, I sense that about you not knowing very Do much you? about you but you do seem. Oh, do you? Yeah, okay. you do seem like you have a kind heart. Like a, you're a warm, yeah. a warm soul. Yeah, I mean for sure. Like I, I, I'm like that, and I'm really like that, like across the board. Because like I mentioned, like I, I've gone on the road, like going on the road to like these, you know, red state backwoods people, where it's like the people who like if you watch liberal or mainstream like media, they'll tell you like these are bad people. Like I've spoke out, spoke to them, and hung out with them. And I'm like, no, they're not bad people. They're just people who have wants and are pulling for them and their own family, which whatever, that's not, I can't like hate, hate them for that. Yeah. I think that's a great thing about comedians too, particularly going on the road is you, you do get to just talk to people all over America. So you're not stuck in that silo that I think people in either of those places can be cities or, you know, the flyover States or whatever they call them. It's, you get to have that one-on-one -on -one time with people and talk to them about what it's like in their city or their their state, and you realize everyone's just trying to survive. Right, and like ninety five percent of like the conversations that I've had, because again, like sometimes I try to avoid it, but sometimes like when people be like, "Oh, where'd you go to college from?" and I let them know that like I, I have a. Poli a political science degree, then like politics will come into it, and then they'll want to speak about politics. But most of it has been like. Re like good conversations where they're just like, you know, I just believe this. And like, I don't necessarily agree with this, but this is, and I'm, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, no, you're entitled to pull for your team, like whatever that is, right? If your team is just like, if your family is all white, then you, you know, like, I, you know, you may argue that, well, you should have empathy towards others. That's one argument, but it's like, I don't knock you for pulling for you and your kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think people, I don't think the average person is, I mean, I hope they're not the person that they play online, <laughs> but I don't know. Because like you said, those people are among us. 
<laughs> yeah, they're, but they're, then I can probably see them. I I know I've made fun. I think there's one time where I was really not mean, but I said something to like a celebrity and called them like a bitch ass because they said something, and it was one of those. It was it was uh, one of those tweets that just I don't know got just. It was a comment that for some reason got a lot of attention and I it was kind of a drive by. I saw their tweet and I think I said something like, could you be a bigger bitch? (laughs) I think it was to like Camille or one of those. It was something ridiculous that they tweeted and I tweeted something ridiculous back. But then I was like, yeah, you could probably point that out and be like, see, you're mean. (laughs) That was like a a mean drive by. Yeah, but that like, is that 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 is. And like, again, I'm not better than them. Like the only difference from like me and anyone who has done it. I've had the thoughts. Yeah, I just don't do it. Like, like I just I mean, I think a it. lot of the time I'm kidding. Oh, I did it to Dane Cook once, too. And well, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> he said, girls suck at Vine. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, you suck at comedy. How about that? asshole?" <laughs> And I'm from Bot, like I'm from the East Coast, so I heard it in my yeah. like, how about that asshole? Yeah. We yeah. roasted each other growing up. I thought that sure. he could take it, and I only I he I had back? no. He retweeted me. I had, by the way, I had 200 followers on Twitter. I had nothing. Like I was no. I had just started doing comedy, but I had no online presence whatsoever. And he retweeted it, and then his followers came after me for like days, and were and he's like, I love my followers. And that was the first time that I realized you can troll your way. Cause then I also got a bunch of followers just from making fun of him. And I was like, Oh, I could troll my way to, to getting followers on Twitter. And it's kind of yeah. funny. I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother world. Like you ever met like a troll, like a professional troll <laughs> where they're like, Oh yeah, I, I just troll. Like, that's just what I do. <laughs> where well, you're like, what do you do for a living? Like oh, what do you, I troll on Instagram. And that's Twitter. crazy. I beg your pardon. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I look at tweets. I retweet, and I just tell you the opposite of whatever you just said. Just contrarian all day. Yeah, yeah, and that'll help you get followers because there's people that um, agree with the opposite, and I just say it in a clever way so they'll follow me. That's hilarious. Yeah, no. So I learned. I learned that, but yeah, that was probably he ended up blocking me. Jeez, I yeah. took it. I was like, "Hey, I said this. I I can own it." You know, if you want to sick your like two million, n- not very good at grammar followers on me, <laughs> I, I can you take got, it. But he never he never said anything though. No, he just retweeted it, and then his followers attacked me and told me that I was ugly and all this stuff. And then, um, and then he was like, "My followers are the best." And then. I never deleted it, but I think he had a special coming out and I think he was kind of insecure about it, but people kept retweeting it. And I, I think, I don't think he blocked me then. I think it was later. Like he was like, fuck this girl. She's in my head. (laughs) I've had, look, I've had those feelings. Like I've had, sometimes I've had like these trolls, like, like say stuff to me, like in the comments or at me or things. And I like, I've had that moment of weakness where I want to tweet back to them. Like, you know, like I'll go to whatever city you are. I'll sleep with your wife. Like I, I, I want to <laughs> say these things, but I, but I don't say them. I'm like, I don't say them. Like I'll go to their page, find their wife, and I'm like, I should try to sleep with their wife. And uh, then, but I don't do it. <laughs> that's really like, funny. I hold myself. I'm, I'm like, there's no need for this. Just they're just having a bad day. You know what I do now? I do the opposite. Like when I get these things, like these weird troll comments, I'll, I'll literally just be condescending, and I'll just be like, Hey, man, um, I hope whatever you're going through works out for you, and. uh I've gotten people to be like, thanks. <laughs> like prayers for you. I'll pray for yeah, you. Like a troll, like a troll being like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, I'm man. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. I'm like, we're we're buddies now. <laughs> yeah, you're friends now. You'll see people will be like that. I think that happened with like Sarah Silverman being nice to somebody who was trolling her and she like completely reformed him and and he considers it one of the reasons that he stopped becoming like a trump supporter was because sarah silverman was nice to him <laughs> Jeez, that's kind of, yeah, man, all right <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot right. going on there yeah there's a lot to unpack on that yeah. one but, um, <laughs> where can we find you this has been so fun you're welcome back anytime you have anything you want to promote please come back Oh, thank you so much. It has been a very fun conversation. I'm at Ian Lara Live on Instagram and uh, Twitter. Don't don't tweet me. Don't say anything to me because I will come to the city and find your wife. No, I'm joking. 
<laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm at uh, Ian Lara Live. Um, and the special's on HBO Max, Romantic Comedy. Go Check watch a special. special. It's so good. Well, yeah, thank keep you so going. Much. I look forward to seeing you on TV and around. And I, I hope if you come to Los Angeles, you hit me up. I appreciate we'll that so much. You. Thank you for having me. It's thank a, you. It's a lot of fun. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Hello. Hello. I look glorious right now. <laughs> How do you feel? Uh, better. Maggie has the plague. Uh, not the actual not plague. Not one from China. <laughs> not the Chinese plague, just the run-of-the-mill plague. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. I'm just so freaking busy, but it's good, you know? Yeah. I like yeah. being busy. I just want to get back on stage. It's all I want to do. I've just been I know. thirsting for it. I could tell when I was editing Ian Lara's this episode, I was like, oh, she's dying to get back. Dying, dying. I think it took, it It like had to get to this point though. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. You have to want it this badly, I think. I don't know why comedians even do it. I'm always <laughs> astonished that they're willing to do it. So it is, it's like, it's like a calling, you know, you, people are just, I keep to trying to run from it and I just can't. I've, I think I've par partially, it's just surrendering to the idea that I, even if it's like, I just do it locally, you know, I don't need yeah. to be a road comic. I don't need to, I think I, I put up so many barriers to getting up and it's no, like, you, it doesn't matter. I just comic. have to get on stage to, yeah. Two or three nights a week, probably when I get up and running, but at least once a week, just for yeah. my own mental health. Yeah, which is hilarious that you need comic stand up <laughs> for your mental health. But I think that's true for comics who do it. And no, you can't be a road comic. It's just going to be a different path for you. But you know, you're you're busy doing too many other things, but you definitely like you love it and you're I good love at it, it and you need to get into the groove again. And I love it. And all of my friends who are comedians, that's the other thing I've really realized and have been looking at is that the people Megan Kelly's been very supportive. Rogan's very much a comedian and somebody who's in this weird space, but I think he transcends it and he's very supportive, but he's very supportive of me getting on stage and yeah. encouraging of it. And so is Whitney. And I have yeah. these people and they give me opportunities and they platform me and people who are pundits who are ostensibly my friends I will not right. be naming any names. Don't. And in yeah. fact, I often act like I don't exist. And so. And kind of just poach from you. So I, I have to really. And I really don't want to be a pundit. I have to roll back. And I don't want to be a failed comedian that became a pundit. No. No. And you're not a failed comedian. But I easily could be labeled that. Yeah. If I continue to be a pundit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if you just you have to get back doing stand up. Like yeah. if you're doing it, then you're not failed. You're doing it. No, and I love it. It's just I took a long break from it, but I also had a baby and yeah. Yeah, it started a company and No, everything. I'm ready. I'm so I dream I've been dreaming about it. Like just dreaming about being on stage and I I also think it's those are more my people. I feel so much camaraderie with comedians. It bothers me that those episodes aren't the ones that get because everybody's so obsessed with like the culture wars. Uh -huh. They just don't listen to the comedians as much as they do the the culture war. Yeah. And the comedian episodes are my favorite because they're so random. You just end right. up laughing and talking about the most random stuff. I know. The Ian Lara one was hilarious. I was sitting, like, watching it, dying laughing. He's just so funny. I was thinking about the Kathleen Madigan one. I want to have her back on just because I love her so much and how fu how funny that episode was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are. They're all really funny. And those are, I, they just feel like my people. Yeah. I don't, I don't, and this is something that came up when I was talking to Rob today. I don't feel like I belong. I feel like I belong with comedians. Yeah. I, I, it's probably why I gravitated so much towards comedy in general was because the first time I ever got on stage, I'm like, why haven't I been doing this my whole life? A and B, when I would be in the green rooms with all these comedians, I felt 
even even though it was like dysfunctional and kind of fucked up, I was like, yeah, these are my people. You know, yeah. everybody's hustling, working side jobs and messed up usually from some kind of, you know, t- toxic situation. And when I'm what I was talking about with Rob and why I love his story, Rob Henderson, who will be coming up in the next few weeks. He's such an interesting case of someone who came from foster care and then he went into the army and then went to Yale and now he's at Cambridge getting a PhD. And he's the one who came up with the whole concept of luxury beliefs and it occurred to him when he was at Yale and he would hear all of these people espousing these beliefs that they didn't even really apply to themselves. And he came from such a like poor working class, unstable upbringing that he would kind of question why they would be wanting that for people if they didn't even experience that or want that for themselves. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why I was thinking about it the other night about just the sheer luxury of having family stability. Like my parents still together, still like just, I've never not known that, you know, we were just always stable. Yeah. Yeah. No, he just, it's it's a fascinating episode. He talks about how there's so many studies that show instability has more in, of an effect on your future, whether you go to college, whether you become an addict or not. It's instability even more than poverty. So if you come from an uh, unstable upper class family, you're more likely to get addicted to drugs, end in divorce, et cetera, than if you come from a lower class poverty stable. family and poverty that's still together and stable wow yeah that's crazy i was like oh do i but feel this so on a cellular yeah. level yeah yeah it makes so much sense even just listening to you and jaron's factory settings recently i've just been like it's been driven home to me over and over again about how your trajectories are so similar based off of like when they're when your family's both like divorced and then you just both experienced a lot of instability. Well, he was saying too, Rob was saying too, that we often hear his story, stories of people who, J.D. Vance, who come from these, you know, West Virginia, like poor rural America, foster care, and they pull themselves up. But what we don't hear are stories like Jaron and I's where we're middle, upper class, and it was a downward trajectory. We both ended up right. with working class jobs and so we Drug had, yeah, and, yeah, because of instability usually. Right. So it was really fascinating. I love him. I just love this podcast. I love being able to talk to Ian Lara, who's freaking hilarious and had me dying laughing. And mm-hmm. I love being reminded that I am, in fact, a comedian. But to find, wrap up my point and this check-in, I was talking to Rob about how I still don't feel like I belong when I'm sitting at a table of pundits and thinkers and writers who all kind of cruise through into academia and went to college and didn't really ever have to work a manual labor job or even have to work a job when they were in high school, you know, part time. Right. I just still never feel I feel like I came upstairs from downstairs at Downton Abbey and somehow, you know, like the valet who kind of right. married into the family or something. But I I don't feel like I I never feel like I belong. And he was saying a lot of studies back that up that you you always even if you end up pulling yourselves up and making it making millions or whatever you still kind of always feel like the class that you are or or were for for a long time even if i was middle to upper class i i still feel more working class after decades of just that was my reality yeah and i think you'll always feel that way but it's not to say you don't belong but you know that i think that more than anything that is like a guiding a guiding feeling about where, where you, that you should follow, like where you think you should go in terms of what you want to be doing. Yeah. I, I, it's fine. I can sit and Rob and I were saying that he's like, you know, I can sit there and I can have these three course meals and be in this place, but I feel more comfortable in a green room with a bunch of comedians. Right. 
you know, and, and or like he said, getting going to like a roach coach in L.A. and getting a taco than he does it somewhere with fancy wines and multiple sets of silverware. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. It, it's I, I don't know. I get to talk to so many cool people. It's just yeah. I would love to see actually Rogan talk to him because. I'd love to see a like three hour conversation and really hear his story teased out. He's going to, he has a memoir coming out in 2024, which he said was extremely hard to write. And had he known how hard it was going to be to write it, he never would have written it, which was a also (laughs) cautionary tale. Yeah. (laughs) And, but I would love to hear their, I'm always so impressed with the conversation, the like questions that Rogan thinks to ask in the moment. Yeah. But I think that he deserves that kind of long form storytelling opportunity. He's just such a interesting, interesting person in this space. Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. I could have talked to him for hours. So he'll be back on too when his book comes out to talk more about his story in particular. Because we got to the end of the hour and then we got to his story and he told me he had a memoir. I'm like, let's just save it. Yeah, for another time. Yep. There's so many, I know it's so, you talk to so many interesting people. I've been introduced to like a wealth of new people and it's always like, wow, I do. I want to hear more from this person. You're always like, we have to have you back on. I'm like, but you're always finding new people and then trying to get the old people back on. It's just, it is. We need to get that. I mean, I can see why Rogan does it five, four or five days a week. Right. For multiple hours at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And has people back over and over again that he likes to just digest the culture with because there are certain people I just like to digest the culture with Rogan being one of them and also Malice you know Malice and I've had multiple conversations I just was on his podcast and it's always so easy and fun and yeah it's just it's cool I do love this format feel very lucky to be able to do it and to be able to talk to the people that I'm able to talk to yep podcasts will save the world I believe it especially this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. <laughs>